First of all, you know, I have not spoken in a university in North India. I've spoken in South because I was here. So, um, you know, I've done other types of things. So this is an interesting opportunity for me. But I had asked one of my friends that I wanted to actually meet students. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. So I, I want to just get an idea. Are most of the students here undergraduates or graduate students? How many are undergrads? OK. How many are graduate students? OK. And then everyone else is professors. OK. OK. So what I thought I would do, um, the title of the talk that I wanted to do, was, um, that we decided to do, is called, um, let me see if this comes up. It's called Innovation Anytime, Anyplace by Anybody. And I'll start, uh, I'm going to ba basically tell this in a story format, because I think those are the most compelling ones. So it's a lot of what I'm going to share is very personal. But it also is imbued with um, my work since 1978. And I'm going to take you through what I'm doing right now. I've started about six companies over the last um, 30 years. And we just started a new company called Cytosolve, and I'll talk about that in another curriculum that we've started. But it's been really, um, a lot of it you're going to hopefully get across on how you can take ideas from what you're doing, and if you want to convert them to entrepreneurial businesses, you know, uh, the stories hopefully will help you do that. But the reason I have this picture up is in 1993, a lot of my work um, was in pattern analysis, in pattern recognition. And I was building, um, in 93, I was in, back in the PhD program, I was building a platform for doing broad scale generalized pattern analysis. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and I thought, what would happen one day when you have a robot that maybe can talk to you, right? Very much, and uh, you're sitting across eating dinner with this, and you'll be asked this compelling question, what makes you different than this machine? So that was a question that I asked myself, what makes us, because one day there will be things that can probably do a lot of the things that we do and what makes us different than a machine. So that made me really start looking at my own life. And uh, I grew up actually in Bombay. My parents are from South, but I never um, spent a large part of my life there. Most of my uh, life was in India. So in, even in India when I was young, I grew up in these two worlds. I was sharing with Sanjeev and Professor Kaur in, you know, in Bombay. And then the other extreme was I used to spend three, four months in a village where my grandmother was actually a farm worker. And some of you have been to South India. These are sort of the villages. These are sort of the scenes that you see. But my grandmother was a farm worker. She worked 16, 17 hour days in the farm. Um, but in the evenings, or in the, in the, um, in the weekends, you know, th we have Indian systems of medicine, right? Some of you may know Ayurveda, uh, Unani. And these are systems of medicine which have a whole lingua franca to them. And we don't understand them that well. At least most of Western science doesn't. But, but my grandmother used to practice a method where she could look at people's faces and understand what was going on inside their bodies. Basically, you could, it's not really magic. But for me as a child, it seemed magical. But it was basically a form of pattern analysis. And today, we know a lot of the uh, medical schools, biomedical engineering, is trying to take, you know, they're trying to listen to voice. They're trying to look at iridology and trying to correlate those to different disease patterns. But so that's what mot has always been a motivating factor. How do these systems work? How was this woman who had very few degrees able to assess people and then come up with modalities? And we can argue, do they work or not, right? But um, the other side of me, I think many people here grew up on some level of folklore. But I grew up with my grandmother on these great stories of Rama, right? Fighting good and evil. So my heroes at a young age were uh, you know, these kinds of radical heroes, you know, Bhagat Singh or Crazy Horse or uh, che Guevara. And this is actually a picture of me at MIT in 1981 burning the South African flag. MIT had about 100 million invested in South Africa. This was at a time when apartheid was not in vogue, right? So uh, I was always interested in social change also. But at the same time, this is a picture of me in 1980, uh, where I'd built the first email system back in 78. And those two are my high school teachers. And this was a, a, a document that was done. But there was the other side of me, which challenged the MIT president. But when you look at my personal life in 78, um, my interest in what my grandmother did, actually, uh, I had, at the age of 14, 15, I had taken a whole series of computer science classes at New York University. In 1977, there was a professor at NYU by the name of Henry Mullish, and he saw the trend that there would be a need for software engineers worldwide. So Henry actually took out an ad in the New York Times. He'd gotten National Science Foundation funding, and he had invited um, 40 students. He selected 40 students in the high school level. You had to be at least 16 to come to NYU to study um, in an immersive course. You would learn programming languages. So I was one of those 40 selected. 
So any, you've been to New Jersey, right? You're, you're New York. So, but it, I lived in New Jersey at the time. My parents in 19. Who are you? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot. But you'll find out where innovation anytime, any place comes from now. Okay. So you gave it away almost. But in 1970, um, my parents, you know, these very traditional South Indian parents had moved to New Jersey. And this was, if anyone knows what 1970 was, that was post-Vietnam era, a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the United States, right? So here's this very traditional family moves to Patterson, New Jersey, which is probably one of the poorest cities in the United States. But we went to public schools. You know, my parents would save whatever money they had, and they'd move to the next school system. So uh, in uh, 78, uh, when I was selected, I went to NYU. I had, I had actually finished calculus and everything by then. I had really no courses my high school had to offer. So I was actually planning on dropping out of high school. Obviously, my mom was very upset. And she introduced me to a physicist at this medical school and a biologist. And at this medical school, University of Medicine Dentistry of New Jersey, they had three campuses, very small school in Newark. Anyone heard of Newark, New Jersey? Well, Newark is predominantly African-American, again, one of the poorest cities in the United States, and most people would think nothing would come out of Newark. But Les Michelson was a um, physicist there. He had come out of Brookhaven, and Les had set up a wide area network among three schools, Piscataway, New Brunswick, and Newark. Uh, wide area network had nothing to do with the Internet, ARPANET, none of that. And uh, he, my mom introduced me to him, and he said, Shiva, would you like to create the electronic version of the inter-office mail system? So that was one thing that I was calling over. The other thing was I, I met another gentleman um, who, was, who had a tremendous amount of data on uh, sleep, babies' patterns. You know, it turns out babies, like the, pic the baby you see here, uh, babies can die in their sleep, what's called sudden infant death syndrome. At that time, UMDNJ had a lot of data on collab collaboration with Montefiore Hospital on 48-hour sleep data. And babies actually have six states of sleep. Humans have five. And the idea was, could you use pattern analysis methods to look at very much like stock trading, right? You're probably doing, right? But could you see a pattern and could you predict the onset of an apnea? And that's what, uh, so, so I ended up publishing a paper on it. Uh, it was fascinating, but again, it was in this vein of pattern analysis. But the other part of it, so that was one project I was doing. The other part was in this medical school, um, anyone over the age of 40, which no one else, no one here looks like the age of 40, so but except me, but anyone over the age of 40 will remember most uh, offices, large offices, had what was called the inter-office mail system. Okay, anyone remember this? But if you remember the inter-office mail system, uh, in an office was typically someone who sat like this. Typically it was a woman, a secretary. She had a typewriter. And she had, if you look on your inbox, outbox, and there was a physical inter-office envelope. And this was not just the exchange of simple mail. It was a very complex system. At UMDNJ, they had pneumatic tubes. You know, you would... Uh, the secretary would have paper, carbon paper. She had an inbox, outbox, folders, trash bucket. These were physical items. And for a mail to go from one office to another was a very complex process. First of all, you, you needed to type it. You needed to put an envelope. If you needed to do carbon copies more than three, it was very complicated, right? Because you'd have the, the typewriter could only hold a certain number of carbon papers. You'd, sometimes you'd be typing all day. And um, so the challenge I was given was, would you want to create this inter-office mail system into its electronic equivalent? And uh, so th that's me back, I think I'm about 15 then, with Michelson, who's on the left. And those terminals were the old 78 terminals. They were HP terminals, uh, three mainframe computers this university had. And what I ended up doing was I created the electronic version of the inter-office mail system, 50,000 lines of code. It was not a simple system. And if you go on the internet, there's a site called Inventor of Email. You'll see anthropologically, in a sense, I went and did the analysis of all these different features that they had, attachments, return receipt, et cetera. And we, and we uh, uh, called it email. Now, email may seem like an obvious term, but it was not back in 1978. And I'll tell you why. Because no one had used it prior to 78. In fact, the first use of the word email, E comes out in E-M-A-Y-L-E, -E, is a 1564 reference to enamel, paint. Now, I didn't have that reference. Yeah, which, which means enamel. But I didn't have that reference when I was 14. <laughs> I didn't have the Oxford English Dictionary. But I called it email because of this was written in the Fortran language. And if you've used, at that time, Fortran, everything had to be in uppercase. The maximum variable length was six characters. The RTE4 HP operating system had a five character limit for naming a pro program. So I called it email. In fact, I thought I should pronounce it e -mall. That's how weird the word was. 
So this inner office mail system, the emphasis on the word system, was called email. And um, so in 19, uh, fast forward now to 2011, I'll come back to this. My mom, I, I was sharing about, he was dying and with pulmonary fibrosis, and in a suitcase she had saved all this, and I didn't talk a lot about this. Went to MIT, four degrees. In fact, the year that I came to MIT, MIT had this on the front page that one of the students created this email system. But in um, 2011, my mom was dying. Uh, a friend of mine came and took all these materials and gave them to Doug Ameth, Time Editor, and Doug published this. Now, the interesting thing was, at that time in 78, the only, you know, so you have to understand, no one understood what software really was in 78. In fact, when I came to the electrical engineering department at MIT and also did a degree in applied mechanics, the mechanical engineering guy said, what's this software? You know, it, it, it was too literally soft. They didn't think it was hard science. And uh, in 81, I was the president of the MIT freshman student body, and Paul Gray was president, and Paul said, Shiva, you know, it's unfortunate the Supreme Court doesn't recognize software uh, patents. It was only in 93, 94 when you could patent software. There's a huge argument whether software should even be patented, but in, in 1980, the United States government changed the Copyright Act of 1976, which only allowed you to copyright musical work and written work to also let you copyright software. So the only way to protect a software invention was through copyright. So that's what you're seeing is the actual, so this, I think I was 17 or 18, I you, there was no download, there was no internet. You had to write to the copyright office, they'd send you the form. I went back and forth and that's a copyright for email. And it, it's an uh, email computer program for electronic system, mail system. So uh, when, after this story came out in uh, 2012, I, I was invited by the Smithsonian. Smithsonian wanted all this material, I had two museums competing for this. Uh, I was going to give it to the MIT Museum. The curator of the MIT Museum said, you know, Shiva, it would be stealing if MIT had it. This actually belongs in the National Archives. So in 2012, I put it in the MIT Museum. This is, it's hard to read this, but I'll read it for you. Um, this, you know, when I, maybe I can zoom in on this. Can I zoom in here? I can't do it, but uh, let me do this. Hopefully I can do this. The reason I wanted to put this up was, this is actually in, uh, have you guys heard of the Intel Awards? Do they have that in India? Um, the Intel Awards is what it's called now, where high school students, it's like the mini Nobels, I call it. So in, in, in 80, 80, I had applied for, it was called the Westinghouse Awards, and I won one of them. But if you can read this, this was, I was writing what email could be. And it, in fact, when I was going through the Smithsonian, it was very weird for me reading this as a 50-year-old looking what the 17-year-old kid wrote. But I was essentially predicting that email beyond telexes would be a very important kind of system. And I was also predicting, if you read the last sentence, it actually says that it would change the attitudes and styles of communication, which email has. And, um, but that was done all before MIT, okay? So 81, I came to MIT, um, never really promoted it as a, Humble Indian, you're taught not to promote things, right? Marketing 101, don't promote yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> Seriously, right? So um, came to MIT, did, you know, did uh, my undergraduate in electrical engineering. We started, uh, when I left MIT after my bachelor's, um, some of you may know the spreadsheet program. Today it's called Excel, but it was called 123. Um, Lotus had, in fact, Lotus had started this company called 123, big company. In fact, the computer in the 80s was known as a 123 computer. It was synonymous to the computer, the spreadsheet. But 123 had very, very poor graphics. So I went and joined this company as a founding engineer. We created the first presentation graphics, the predecessor of PowerPoint. And we sold it to Lotus, to IBM. And then I came back to the Media Lab. The Media Lab had just opened. And the Media Lab's entire vision was to bring artists and technologists together. And Nicholas Negroponte, another one, Muriel Cooper, had started the Media Lab. And the Media Lab was a great place at that time. This was 86 then. So I came back after doing this company. And uh, we, uh, I started getting very interested in scientific visualization. So this is the early days when a lot of data starting to be collected. Um, the animation group at MIT then was headed by Dave Zelser, Muriel Cooper. If you look her up, she's known as a grand dame of visual design or graphic design. So I ended up looking, finding ways to take large amounts of data and how you could use animation and graphics. In those days, I, I literally, my master's thesis, I was up 72 hours straight 
literally making frame by frame, you know, complex graphics. And the project I did was looking at how waves propagate through anisotropic media, which Lord Rayleigh had predicted in the 1800s in a very s patterns. And we had modeled it and we used visualization. We got results. So uh, finished my master's in two fields, applied mechanics as well as in, in uh, at the media lab in visual design. And by 93, I was very interested back in pattern analysis. Because if you look at the field of pattern analysis in every of the domains, everyone's frankly applying the same techniques. If you look at uh, ultrasonic sound signal analysis or speech guys or you know, financial analysis, everyone's doing some type of feature extraction, some type of clustering and some type of learning. But for some reason, the field was very, very segmented. So for my PhD work in 93, I was building a generalized platform. And in the middle of that, um, I got an interesting opportunity to work with the White House. Uh, a friend of mine was a salesperson selling CD-ROM software into the White House. And the White House, um, this is 93. If you remember, 93 was when, anyone remember when 93 was? When Mosaic had just come out. So the, the internet, which was around for many years, became more accessible to the common man through this browser that let you point and click. That was um, the predecessor of Netscape, right? So Mosaic comes out. And you have this, you're about to see this explosive growth in the use of the internet. So the White House is getting 5,000 emails per day. And the way the White House was managing email was a way that they used to manage print mail. So many people looked at print mail's email. So when an email would come in, they would print it out. And the White House had 147 different categories. All right, and those categories were essentially different categories Clinton would get email about. Death threats was about 23 of them. Different, they had different types of death threats. And they had the others were education, you know, drugs, whatever. And then when an email came, they would put it into one of these buckets and they would print out a form letter and they would send it out. So email was doubling every month. So obviously they couldn't do this or they'd have to hire more and more interns, right? So they decided to run National Institute of Standards at that time had a thing called Trek Text Retrieval Conference. And so they gave out a broad-based conference. They gave out these emails, these categories, and they, and they invited four public companies, and I got fortunate to get invited. I ended up winning it. So I ended up beating these four public companies, and I didn't know what to do, so I went to MIT. Legally, MIT's IP rights are, if you do something during MIT time, MIT owns a full IP unless you get a waiver. So I had a lawyer at the time from another business I'd done, and John said, ask MIT if they'd give you a waiver. So I went to the MIT Technology Licensing Office. I said, look, I've created this for, could be used for email categorization. Is MIT interested? And fortunately, MIT said, ah, we don't think email management's gonna be a big field. So I took two, decided to take two years off, left MIT, and we started a company to analyze email. And, um, and at the same time, I'd done another company called Arts Online to put artists up online, and that we weren't making any money. In fact, we weren't even making our monthly numbers. We had to go to uh, a, a casino for making our salary one month, where we had to literally took our visa bills and <laughs> visa cards and gamble. But we ended up getting, in the middle of that, AT&T as our first customer. So AT&T, uh, if you look at the history of AT&T, 94, AT&T had decided to put $10 million into the internet, which is a lot. We were getting $99 for to doing a web page, okay? So AT&T decides to put $10 million if you look at AT&T, it's a very large company. They have 40 different major business units as websites, and every business unit is going to get consumer email. So we said, look, why don't you use our technology where we will analyze the email, categorize it, and it was going to cost them about $18 to $20 to process an email fully loaded. So the IT department, IT guys like to always own everything. Marketing owned the website, so the IT guys didn't want to buy our technology because they thought they'd lose control. So we said, look, we'll host it for you e.g. Cloud, cloud software as a service. So we actually bought a server. We had convinced the mayor of Cambridge to give us some space. Um, we begged, borrowed, and stole, and we had the small company. We bought a server, and we told at and route their emails, and our technology would run sort it, and we'd give them a front end for their call center people to log in. We barely kept the server up 70% of the time, but in, in 1994, no one even knew what server uptime meant, right? But by 99, 2000, you know, we built our own data center. And we were, we were about a 200 million value company. So we grew the company and 300 people. I sold a big piece of it. And um, so that was by, so I ended up, a two year project ended up being actually 10 years, 2003. And you also reduced the number of interns to Exactly, so <laughs> Bill wasn't happy with that, so. 
That's right. That was a punchline. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when I, all I have to do is say interns and everyone, interns and Clinton, everyone laughs. But um, the interesting thing was, so in 2003, you know, when you run a, a large company at a certain point, you find out you're just managing people. You're not doing anything anymore except every day with some babysitting on some raise for some person. You're always dealing with human issues and I was getting tired of that. So I was walking back to MIT and one of my old advisors said, Shiva, look, you, you like building large scale systems. You've always liked medicine, but I like medicine, but I didn't like the reductionist model of giving a single drug to anyone. You know, so I actually was in the Harvard MD PhD program and I'd pull out my medical application. So in 1990, um, Three, uh, I mean, 2003, some interesting events were taking place, is that um, the genome project had just ended around 2002, if people remember, right? We went into the genome project thinking the human being, different between a human being and a worm was a number of genes. We thought human beings had 500,000 genes and maybe a worm had 20,000. It turned out that we have the same number of genes. In fact, plants have more genes than we do. So there was a new field that was getting created called systems biology because it recognized we need to move outside of the nucleus. And this diagram also is one of the issues, just switching back into what was the problems in healthcare. You know, if you go to a doctor today in the Western medical system, uh, the patient is actually separated into multiple things. So you go to a patient, if you have a, let's say you're, you're losing sleep, right? You may get sent to four different specialists. One guy will say you need to go see a shrink, right? A psychologist, another guy will go put you to a neurologist and maybe they think you have an eye issue. So you end up seeing four people. And so this is one phenomenon people are getting tired of in healthcare. The other phenomenon you see in this graph, the numbers haven't changed that much. The left side of this graph is actually telling you year over year spending has been increasing 30% year over year in pharmaceutical companies in terms of R&D. But you would think if you spend a lot more money in R&D, you're gonna get more and more drugs, right? But in fact, it's inverse. Less and less, the FDA is approving less and less drugs. So the pharmaceutical, model is actually broken. They're not generating more drugs by just investing more money. And as I mentioned, this is that graph which shows on the left of the graph you see what the original estimates were for the number of genes and as you go to the right by 2003, you know, you're up to only about 20,000 genes. So systems biology, this is a diagram actually by Peter Hunter who's over at Oxford. Peter's interested in modeling the human heart. But before, he was just looking at coupling, you know, different types of equations. But Peter then, with systems biology, he went all the way down to the fundamentals, which said, okay, you have these many genes, these particular genes control certain type of cardiac functions, right? And those uh, are particular cell types. That goes to certain tissues, et cetera. So Peter has started building this model going bottoms up, right? And the other thing that was happening in systems biology around 2004 was the National Science Foundation put out this grand challenge to model the whole human cell, which was if you look at the cell, is it possible that you could create a, a uh, in silico? So today the way experiments are done in biology, in vitro, right, in a test tube, in vivo, which is in, in an animal or a uh, physical animal, and so this new term that started getting coined was in silico. Okay, so without having to do animal experiments, could you model? Now, if you understand biology, um, I'll sh show you this, so this, if you can see, this is a bunch of, it's a network of reactions. If you, if it, what's that? No, no, it's actually, it's, it's actually proteins. Yeah, it's a proteomic, it's, it's a big kinetic, it, it's a prote, but it's actually uh, proteins, the lines are actually the, uh, the reaction diagrams. So think about this as A plus B going to C, this is just an, so what's happening in biology is, uh, biology is fundamentally an experimental science. There are no ab initio laws in biology. So biologists essentially do experiments. And, uh, and people are doing across scales, right? People may do just how two proteins interact. You could get a Nobel Prize just for looking at the structure of one protein or how protein-protein interactions take place. So biology is highly experimental. So biologists will do individual experiments and publish. And if they get tenure, they're gone, right? They don't try to put those uh, there's no incentive to build large-scale models. So the National Science Foundation said, could you build a computational model of the human cell? So when I, so I decided to come back to MIT at the age of 40, right? And I said, this is a cool area. And up until then, the, the computational guys, they were using what are called statistical techniques. Black box techniques, so you use Bayesian techniques, right? You look at phenomenon, you look at the input, you do some neural network, some type of, you know, Bayesian regression, 
but you never, you never know the internal mechanics. Um, and these equations aren't like gas dynamic equations. They're actually very much more complex. You, you have much more degrees of freedom. So we decided, why don't we treat this as a computer science problem, right? Let's treat this as it's a distributed computer science problem. Biologists are producing individual pieces of the puzzle. And what, what was happening in biology was, if you, if you remember your biology class, you know, and everyone remember the Krebs cycle? Yes? You know those diagrams, A plus B going to C? You know what I'm talking about? So biology has highly been diagrammatic, right? Just pictures. In the last 10 years, with the advent of high throughput computing, biology started moving to mathematical models, which means these diagrams were being converted to models, right? And these models could be stochastic models, they could be probabilistic models, but nonetheless, they were models where the input was some uh, set of species, some iteration, and, and uh, uh, you essentially get these reaction rate diagrams. So we said, if you think about the human cell as a well-mixed reactor, and it's made up of a bunch of pathways, and each pathway is a model, could you not couple these models together? So in the mid-80s, there had been some stuff in coupling, you know, dire uh, direct event simulation, DEVs. So we took some of those mathematics, coupled it with distributed computing. We took a bunch of different fields, and we created an architecture which we call Cytosol. And Cytosol was essentially an architecture where we could take individual components across scale. It's called multi-scale modeling, but multi-scale distributed modeling. So we built this infrastructure between 2003 to 7, and we modeled modeled it. We got our first paper published in 2011. It took a lot, of, a lot of time because most of the biologists didn't understand this. The computational guys were using statistical techniques and most computational biologists, very few of them were computer scientists who built large-scale systems. So that was Cytosol and I'll come back to this. Um, but by 2007, you know, we'd uh, to, this is uh, 2008 is when we finished the research. This got published after I came back from India. I decided, wouldn't it be interesting now to use my knowledge of biology and go try to understand how Indian systems of medicine work? Because it's an area I was very, very interested in, going back to my childhood. So this is a pyramid of biology, right? Where you have proteins and you have functional models. This is where biology is going. Now, I'm not going to give a whole lesson on Ayurveda here, but if you look at the Indian system of medicine, they have a very different approach, right? It's almost an inverse pyramid. You start with this concept of unmanifest energy, which is called purusha, which gives rise to nature, prakriti, which gives rise to what they call gunas. They have five elements, right? Fire, earth, water, metal. And these give rise to, what are they called, doshas. Anyone know any of these terms? Who doesn't know these terms? Oh, you guys do, right? So they have a whole language, a lingua franca. And I was very curious, could you bridge these two worlds, right? East and west. So in 2000 and, um, in 2000, and, uh, this is the front page of MIT because I was an interesting guy there, so they decided to feature me on the 2008 issue where I decided to go back to India to uh, study Eastern and Western medicine. And when I got to India, that's what I ended up doing. I worked with the National Institute of uh, 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 Epidemiology in Chennai, traveled all over India for a year, and I actually found what I believe is an interesting connection between, you've heard of Voth, Pitt, and Cough, right? If you ask an Ayurveda guy what it means, they'll just sort of hand wave. They can't really explain it to you. But the net of it is, I'll come back to this, but Voth, Pitt, and Kaffer are actually systems parameters. They're system theory parameters. And when you look at it that way, it's very fascinating. These ancient yogis or sages are actually system scientists. And I'll come back to that. That's what I discovered. But the other interesting journey when I was in India was I was recruited to run uh, an organization, a new spin-off by in CSIR. Uh, called CSIR Tech, okay, which was because, uh, and I was planning, it was June 2009, I was on my way, the next day was, two days later was my flight back to the United States. I got a call from the Director General, he said, look, why are you going back to the United States? We have this thing called Outstanding Scientists, Technologists of Indian Origin, why don't you stay here? And I had just gotten married, uh, you know, why don't you stay here and help India? So it was uh, relatively an honor and I got put in as the additional secretary, scientist level H. And I was excited because I thought this would be a great way to serve back India with what I had had. And the idea was CSIR since 1947 had produced about two million in revenue. It was set up by Nehru to actually be a translational research institute, not like IISC, fundamental research, but actually to create products. But in those 70 years, it had devolved into publishing papers and patents. And it hadn't really created a lot of significant innovations. 
So I looked at the uh, system and I saw, first of all, a lot of very smart people, right? And the model that I proposed was the same model I'd used for success, which was a scrappy entrepreneur model, which is you don't go writing business plans because the only value that most business plans have are to the person who's writing the business plan who's getting paid to do the business plan, okay? The Harvard Business School guy, <laughs> right, who's charging you a ton of money. But any entrepreneur knows that the only value in any business is if you have something, do you have a customer, right? Because if you have a customer, you learn a lot. Every business I started, in fact, email back in 79, the customer was a university. When I did Echo Mail, we went and sold it to UMDNJ, I mean, to uh, AT&T. And even though we didn't have the code perfect, we had, we knew where we were going, we had a customer, and they paid us something, we'd take the money, and we'd work it with them. So our model, it's a little bit hard to see here, but there were these three phases. So the model was we, we had about a half a million in funding, and, and, and I uh, was able to get agreement before I took this job that I would be able to fund uh, 12 businesses. So I would go find those businesses. If they had something that was valuable and a customer, we would give them about, um, half a crow, $100,000, and they would have to prove the value with that customer. And if that got engaged, we would fund them some more to get more customers, which is really to build their sales and customer service. You follow what I'm saying? Because if you can sell and serve the customer, you actually figure out what the cost of goods is to actually make it profitable. Then we pay you the final 300K to actually do the business plan. You see what I'm saying? We, we backloaded it. So the model was very well accepted. Uh, but the reality was the organization wasn't ready to do something like this, you know? So I ended up writing this report. Um, you probably know the report got me fired. <laughs> and I left India, but I wrote an article for Nature, okay, which innovation demands freedom. And the article was basically about, and I, I asked for an open forum. I said, let's talk about this, because I felt, uh, you know, since 1947 within India, um, we haven't produced one Indian indigenous, right, Nobel Prize scientist in medicine or science. So I felt there were some opportunities because there's such intelligent, raw talent here. So the article called about that, and you can read it, it's up there. But it started really making me think about narratives. So, you know, I, I told you one of the degrees I did at the Media Lab was visualization and narratives. Anyone know what I mean by narratives? Stories, you see? The stories that we hear in our minds, our imagination is far more powerful than even the science we learn, right? Thomas Alva Edison said that if he had actually known metallurgy, he probably would never would have invented the light bulb because the metallurgist told him it was impossible to do those filaments. But sometimes when you don't know and you imagine things or you have, na narratives are very powerful. Hollywood does this, right? Hollywood creates narratives for us. Bollywood does this and those narratives go into our mind. So I started thinking about who writes these narratives and when I was back in the States in 2011, there was an interesting movie that came out. I don't know if you saw this called The Inside Job. Anyone see this? Did you see it? Great movie. It's about the financial collapse of 2009. And when you, read, when you hear this movie, it's fascinating because um, the movie's really about, uh, this guy is interviewed in the movie, okay? I'll tell you who this guy is, but this guy wrote a very beautiful report and it's called The Financial Stability in Iceland, okay? Anyone know what happened in Iceland? The whole economy collapsed, right? So, and, and after that report came out, two months after this comes out, the, the economy collapsed. So it's a very well done report uh, written by this guy. Turns out he's uh, one of the uh, main professors of economics at Columbia University. Okay? Now he didn't reveal the fact that he was actually paid by the Icelandic government. Okay? So the movie came out in the inside job. Matt Damon, if you have a chance to see it, won an Academy Award. The guy who did this movie had never done a movie before. Charlie Ferguson. Charlie went to MIT, did his PhD, started Vermeer, a computer science company, which he sold to Microsoft. Okay, so the reason I'm giving you this example, you don't have to be in any one field, okay? The world has a lot of opportunities. So, but, but the book is an interesting book because it talks about narratives, right? And interesting things, this guy never got thrown in jail, right? <coughs> which is another interesting phenomenon, right? It's easy to attack the Wall Street guys, but, um, People like this are still allowed to do their jobs. But it brings up other, other interesting stories. You know, for 50 years, we were told that smoking was good for you. Did you know that? <laughs> Seriously, there's a book Make that, huh? Makes, Makes you relax, it's great. Um, Robert Proctor, my, one of my uh, colleagues th that I'm still friends with, Noam Chomsky, Noam sent me this book. Um, but this book documents for 50 years 
how the collusion between scientists and the tobacco company to actually write narratives that smoking is good for you. The reason I'm telling you this is we all write in science beautiful papers. We all know we spend a lot of time on the fonts, right, making it look good. My point is we need to rethink what we're doing as scientists also. We're also storytellers to some extent. And uh, this is not that new. I mean, this is a trial of Galileo, right? Galileo said, look, the sun is the center of the solar system. The priesthood at that time, they crucified and vilified him. And if you read this article, it was only in 1992 did the Catholic Church say we did a mistake. Okay? So when I got back to MIT, I started saying, you know, it would be really interesting to teach MIT students how to see these connections. Why is it that people don't see these underlying, why is for 50 years this could get away with? So I started a course called Systems Visualization. I took my interest in systems and my love of art and graphics. Um, by the way, the arts online business, I said, we actually fund a lot of arts organizations. So, um, by the way, a few days ago was Women's Day. I don't know if anyone knows this, so unfortunately there's no women here. We should get some more women in here. That's your guy's job. But um, uh, anyone know who this woman is? Florence Nightingale. Do you know who, who was Florence Nightingale? Well, she should be in the news right now because Tanya is in the news. Exactly. <laughs> But Florence Nightingale is always seen as a nurse, but she was also a member of the Royal Society of Statistics. Okay, very few people know this. In fact, she was the founder of the modern healthcare system. Again, the word system there. And this is a very famous visualization she did. I would also say she was probably the modern founder of scientific visualization. This is a very famous diagram, and what the diagram shows, if you look around the circle, she was looking at the Crimea War. And the fact is that soldiers were actually dying, not because of the battleground, but because of the wounds in the hospital. And what you see there is if you start at clockwise and you go around the circle, you'll see the blue wedges, each wedge is a year, represents, the blue represents how many soldiers were dying off the battlefield in the hospitals. The, the red and the black, uh, red is actually, the, the black is actually what they're actually dying on the soldier field, and the black is, I forget what the black is, but the point is, the blue is the important one. So when she represented this to the royalty at the time, they got it, and they led her, and she said, look, what we need to do with hospitals, with this diagram, she said, we need to give hygiene, we need to have nursing, we need to keep the place clean. And, and she realized if you clean the hospitals, then doctors would come there to do clinical research. Hospitals at that time in the 1800s were, do you know what they were for? You went there to die. That's what they were for. So um, in my class, the students actually look at complex systems and they take on a very complex project. One of the students here is looking at uh, how the media influences stock trading, right? So students start looking at these complex connections th and then they develop metaphors to be able to display them. So the idea is we want to make them consumable. In fact, in this class, we start out the first lecture looking at a famous paper by Edward Tufte. Tufte is a guy who did uh, visual, uh, visual display of language in, the 18, in 1980. But Tufte had this paper when the space shuttle blew up. He argued that the reason it blew up was the engineers didn't know how to communicate visually their knowledge to management. And he, he argued that if they communicated it better, they would have stopped the shuttle. The, the engineers, I don't know if you know, 48 hours before the launch, they told Morton Thiokol not to launch, but they decided to launch anyway. So, in, like this woman is looking at should you be a vegetarian or a carnivore? It's a big debate. So she uses the cow system as a metaphor. She looks at all the systems. But, uh, so it, it, it went from a class of 60 to class of 55. It became the most popular elective at MIT because it crossed all different boundaries. You had students across the board and they could also do, be artistic. So this is another student who really wanted to look at how much of the sun's solar energy we get. So they do these d nice diagrams. I don't have, you know, I can show you this one, but another student, he was actually from um, Egypt. He did, Kareem did this where the left side of the diagram, maybe I can launch it if you guys want to see this. Maybe I can't. Oh, we can't get online. It's okay. I'll show it to you later. But the left side of the diagram is the interconnections before 9-11 between the government, different institutions, and the right side is after. He also did a beautiful visualization where he starts looking at dif different correlations. So before 9-11, you know, the number of bills in Congress for privacy were all held up. Heroin sales was very low. Uh, military expenditures were low. After 9-11, you see explosive growth in heroin sales, also interestingly enough. 
So, you, so with these visualizations, people sign very interesting. Huh? I don't know. You decide. We didn't. So we left it up to people to think about it because he he's an Arab guy in America. He didn't want to make any political statements. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. So, but he he. This is a very compelling way. But this was another one. I wish I could show you the visual. But this was a uh, a kid who wanted to look at. Uh, you, have you heard of fair trade? You know, like in coffee, they say, oh, we're treating the poor people in developing countries well, we pay them well. Well, he, he did a very interesting analysis of taking a cup of coffee and the whole coffee production system. And what he finds is that one cup of Starbucks coffee actually requires 1,000 cups of water necessary to create one cup of coffee. And those 1,000 cups of water are coming from a developing nation. And when you actually do the system analysis and the interconnections, you find out Starbucks profits went up by 2,400%. The retailers went up by 230%, but the growers actually went down by 25%. So it's not so fair trade, okay? So when I started coming back, we, and you can look at this at the healthcare system. By the way, the red graph there, the red line is the amount. You notice a red line, there's a yellow line. The yellow line is how much um, of the GDP of the U.S. is spent on defense. The red line is healthcare. So hospitals are actually very profitable. So everyone attacks the defense department, but hospitals actually make quite a bit of money. So it's terms of GDP. So when you look at the drug development process, it takes right now, if you look at this diagram, 15 years to create one drug, $5 billion. And the drug that comes out has a lot of toxic side effects. And I, I think I've shared you with this graph. The other thing in healthcare is you have a 20% chance, up to 25, if you go into the hospital, you're going to die of some other illness, or you're going to get sick somewhere else. And go talk to anyone, uh, for people you know. They go in and they get sick some, with something else. So when I got back from India, we, we ended up starting a course here, which I call, this is another, so after India, we started two companies, and this is bringing you more up to date. One is called Systems Health. And when I got back from India, I had found this connection. Maybe I could show it here. Can I show this? So I'm gonna just tell you what Vatha, Pitta, and Kapha are, and hopefully you'll appreciate your own, our own Indian science. But um, you've heard of these terms, right, Vatha? Pitta, Kapha. Anyone know what they are? Hmm. But from a systems model. Close. But what Vata really is transport. Okay? Pitta is conversion. Okay? And Kapha is really storage or structure. Okay? So if you look at your iPhone that you have, right, transport is really I.O., input, output. It's movement. Okay, conversion is this, the, this you know, the uh, CPU, right? And this is your, you know, RAM or your hard drive. It's exactly what Jerry told the teaching in his course. Well, I don't, I don't know what he teaches, but he doesn't use Vata Pitta Kapha. Exactly. No, no. He does exactly the right thing. Right, right. No, no. This is, yeah, so systems theory guys know this. Yeah. But when you decipher this, you find out that what the ancient yogis had come to, and unfortunately, we put them in saffron robes and put vibhuti on them, and this stuff is lost, unfortunately. But if you rip all that away, these guys were really, they had had enough knowledge that they had come to a meta understanding how, how large scale systems operated, and these were essentially three parameters. But this is what Vath, Pitt, and Kapha are. And so when they looked at a human being, they tried to modulate, I mean, an air book is, a lot of vata, right? Tra high transport, you can move it, versus a big mainframe. You see what I'm saying? So that's what they were doing, and then they assessed each food based on that. So what I did was we took that, we deciphered this, and we created a course, can you go back to this, called Systems Health. And Systems Health was literally taking Ayurveda and Siddha, bringing it to modernized ways, and we taught a lecture series at MIT where we'd have 200 people show up on a Thursday, MDs, PhDs, yoga teachers, and we created a whole course series where we looked at all the systems terms, control system theory, and we matched it with the Ayurvedic text set. And you, you almost get a one-to-one -one mapping. So it basically unraveled this. We created, now, at MIT, you know, this is sort of a radical course because MIT gets a lot of its funding from pharma, right? So we ended up taking it outside. I didn't want to wait, and we created a business, Systems Health. Um, you may know of a MD in the U.S. called Deepak Chopra. So Deepak runs the Chopra Center. Deepak started offering this, and now we have three medical schools offering this in the U.S., and it's growing, so we're going to, I think this is going to scale to probably about a $30 million business in two years. So we're basically teaching MDs plus practitioners 
the Indian system of medicine, but in a completely different way that it helps them bridge these two worlds. So that's one business we've done very successfully. And one of the things we do is we've actually created an app. So what you see is we've figured out a way through visualization. So the, the triangle is a three-dimensional way to represent voth, pith, and cough, or transport, storage, and conversion. So we ask a set of questions, right? And it basically maps you. The red circle is your system state, your natural system state. What in Ayurveda you call prakriti. The black is what they call vikriti. So all of us technically have some resonance where we like to operate at. And if you are under different conditions, you're operating away. And then through email and different things, we send you little nudges, the different types of exercise, foods, and supplements you can do to get back on program. And we've done it in a very interesting mathematical way where we've literally taken every food exercise and we've started empirically finding a vector coordinate to it, okay? Not perfect, but it gives a way to understand this. And uh, I was just at the Chopra Center and we closed about 200 sales of this. So it's growing. So I know this is going to, because there is this desire now to look for other ways besides going into the hospital, right? Besides, you know, following, taking drugs, people are looking for alternatives, but they need to understand what the ancient models were. The other business we spun off is Cytosol. Um, Cytosol, so that technology I showed you that we created for modeling, I'm going to wrap it up in two minutes, for modeling the cell, uh, I came back in 2011, I put in about 300,000 of my own money and we raised about another million, and we created a tool now to um, model disease. But no one would believe us, so what we ended up doing was we started doing some initial experiments. So what you see in this diagram, the outer circle is a cell wall, the inner circle is a nuclear wall. So this is an example where we review about 5,000 papers. And this is where, this is inflammation. Inflammation, it turns out, could be the source of a lot of disease. And every line and circle, there's coming from multiple experiments. The yellow circle is curcumin, which is the active ingredient in curry. And we can see all the places that curry interacts in the body. It has definitely anti-inflammatory effects. It supports, uh, you know, huh? Turmeric. Turmeric. But the active ingredient, there's the other. So now what we could do is everyone's wondered, well, what happens if I drink, eat some curry, and I have a glass of red wine, right, resveratrol? So we can model those things. And then, but not statistically. You see, statistically, you never understand mechanism. So we're doing a lot of coupled equation. But then with that, we can run in silico experiments. So what you see on the first line is the, the, the third column is where we're simulating 0.15 denotes high level of cytokines, which is a biomarker for inflammation. We're not adding any curcumin, any resveratrol. Then we just add curcumin, 5 micromolar. You see it drops by nearly about 200, 300%. The next experiment, we just add resveratrol, it too drops. But this is what everyone talks about, the synergistic effect. We add a little bit of resveratrol, a little bit of curcumin. Molarity-wise, the same amount. You see it drops down to 0.3. So this is really cool. So this is why you know, um, most of the Indian um, chemistry was you didn't use this much turmeric, right? You had curry, which is a little bit of mixture. So pe pepper, for example, increases bioavailability. So there's reasons people do these combinations, but Western medicine, pharmaceutical, just relies on one active ingredient because that's what they can understand. Now, in the middle of while we were doing our work, this paper came out in Nature called Combinatorial Drug Therapy. Um, the w there's a recognition now you have to do drug cocktails. You can't just give one drug to cure disease. So this paper is a theoretical paper saying, you know, we need to do this for cancer. Now, we don't know who the authors are. Um, but we're the only ones referenced here as a, uh, the only platform that can do this. So this was big excitement for us. And with this, what we decided was, so we had created this technology. So we could have gone two ways, be become a software company, selling our stuff to pharmaceutical companies. I had done that with Echomail, and I didn't want to be selling software again because it's a long sales cycle with pharmaceutical companies. So we decided that we would actually go be a pharmaceutical company. So we took our 1.3 million and we modeled, we took all the papers that have been written on pancreatic cancer. We modeled apoptosis plus cell proliferation. Then we looked at all the generic drugs that were out there. And there's about 269 drugs for cancer. And we found the multi-combination drug. The left side is what you see. You see the very high frequency signal, that's cell proliferation. The right side is when we use our drug combination. The left one is what you, the gold standard, which is called gemcitabine. So we took that, and we also looked at apoptosis, and we went end to end from um, 
you know, the left end is where we looked at the drug, scanned them, ran it, optimized it. And what you're seeing here is in 11 months, this is a letter from the US FDA giving us allowance to go to clinical trials. Okay, so it normally takes six and a half years. So we're on the, about to do something very revolutionary. If email was revolutionary, Cytosol is going to be, and I don't think this is any hyperbole, is going to really change the face of medicine. And we have people wanting to throw money at us now. Um, these are, this is a list of about the 30 main diseases. You can't see the numbers, but it's about a trillion dollars is a spend that's spent in drug, drug development right now. So uh, you can't see this, but let me just show you. The other thing we've done is, so we're going to have Cytosol. We really have three divisions. One's going to be a pharmaceutical division. But I'm, fat, frankly, very interested in food and health. Um, so what we started doing was, anyone have Brufin here? I think India is the biggest supplier of Brufin, right? Anti-inflammatory. You call it Brufin, right? Advil? Right. It's an anti-inflammatory. Um, it causes also kidney issues, okay? So what you're seeing here is a bottom graph is where we're simulating with Cytosol inflammation. So you have a lot of it. The second graph from the bottom is when you take Brufin, um, there's a chemical in your body called prostaglandins. It brings it down significantly. Then we're starting to do tests with what happens if you combine some curcumin with some ginger, with chocolate, with cannabis, the stuff that comes from marijuana, right? What happens? Um, you look like you're smiling there. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the top is, um, what you see the top one is where we're doing the combination. You see we're getting close. But what's more interesting is we started saying what happens if we combine these natural ingredients with Advil. So we reduced the dose of Advil to one-tenth. And the yellow graphs there represent the nutraceutical. The purple is just Advil. But you see we're getting better performance. At one-tenth the dosage, by adding these other nutraceuticals, we can create essentially new products. And this is essentially what these yogis were doing, right? So the end of it is, uh, hopefully I won't bore you too much, but what I've hopefully shared with you is that, you know, I've been in and out of MIT, as you said, right? I never followed the straight path. But we've done well. You know, we've created six companies. We're on our seventh one, seventh and eighth one right now. And, um, and when you look at the reality of innovation, you know, the, the reality is I, yes, I created a lot of things at MIT, but there were things I did before MIT. So my view is innovation can occur really anytime, you know, anywhere, any place, by anybody. Um, Philo Farnsworth was the 14-year-old farm boy. So if you look at the two biggest innovations of the last century, which was, I believe, t in communications, TV and email. Both of them took place by 14-year-old kids. Absolute fact. Philo was 14-year-old, 600-person small farm town in Franklin, Idaho. He invented TV. He saw the way the, plow the fields were plowed, the raster lines. He built it, patented it at a time when you could patent it. RCA and Sarnoff stole his stuff, threw so much legal stuff against the guy. That almost destroyed him. He died an alcoholic. His wife was an artist. She saved all of his sketches. And it was peripheral news for a long time. Finally, it came out. And now there's a big statue of him in Washington. But he is the father of TV. And there's me as a 14-year-old kid. Uh, but what I want to share with you is a 14-year-old Indian boy who invented email in 1978. And it's time every Indian embraces that. And we all embrace it. Not because of me, because it's more to this larger story that when you look at that robot, you know, the difference between us and a robot is really the fact that hopefully human beings reflect on themselves. Maybe a robot will do that, but unless you reflect on who we really are, which I think is really absolutely creative people. And that creativity is what life is frankly all about to me. And um, so what I've done last year is after, you know, the interesting dialogue that took place on the internet, in spite of the facts, I decided to create a foundation. We put in some money into it. We want to identify six young kids in India between the age of 14 through 20 and also in, and we launched this with the mayor's office back in Newark, New Jersey called Innovation Corps and we want to create the same ecosystem and that ecosystem for me was not money because in 1978 I had really five ingredients a good family, public school system, we were talking about this um, we had a teacher, a woman who fought with the school system to change the rules so I could travel so this 14-year-old kid could travel to Newark, a good mentor, Les Michelson, and above all, a lot of respect. I was never treated as a 14-year-old kid. There were people who were 20, 30, 40 years older than me and given freedom. And in that environment is where email came. In that environment, if you read Philo's stories, where TV got invented, he had a good mentor, et cetera. 
And uh, we just put out this book called The Email Revolution, which discusses this, and the book is out, and all the proceeds are going to the foundation. In fact, an, any money that I'm making from Systems Health, we're putting into that foundation also. But I think there's a lot of other people out there who can innovate. Yes, innovation can take place at the IITs and MITs, definitely, right? No doubt about it. But the world needs to create, according to Jim Clifton, who's the head of Gallup, around 3 billion jobs in the next 10 years. He says right now we have about 1.2 billion. There's a 1.8 billion job deficit. And it's not going to happen through innovation centers. Yes, we can all talk about innovation centers in Silicon Valley and MIT, but it's not going to happen that way. You need to disperse innovation much more globally, like Little League, like we were talking about at the local level. So we're about to likely get some funding for Innovation Core through, a, um, through the small community banks. In India, I think you have about four major banks, right? In the U.S., believe it or not, there's 7,000 banks. No, India is Is there community banks? Well, the post office has more money in it than all the banks. Oh, okay. So, so maybe they're the vehicle. So in the U.S., we're working with the community banks um, to unleash Innovation Core. So Innovation... Microfinance, yeah. So, not, not the way the, yeah. uh, you know, the guys want to make money. Right, right, right. Not the 18%, 50% interest I'll rate. Tell you about it. Right. <laughs> so, anyway, so that's what, uh, so the slogan that we've come up with this is innovation anytime, anyplace, by anybody. That means in all places. And uh, anyone who's interested, let me know. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this and maybe we'll take some, are we okay to take yeah. some questions? I think I went over about 10 minutes. Thank yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. So, so one of the things is, so here, here's the issue. I don't have, um, if you look at, so here, here's the deal, right? Right now, if you look at the drug development process, right, they find a synthetic drug. Right, it's created somewhere. Then it goes down where you do a lot of in vitro testing, and typically in animal cells. You know, and then you go to in vivo with pig or rat, and then you go into clinicals, right? If you look at most of the papers that are published, they're already done in in vitro and in vivo. So in, and these are all publicly funded, peer-reviewed research. The issue is if you can aggregate those research pieces, which is what we've done. So it's not like we're not doing animal experiments. We are. We're saying let's leverage the ones that have been done. But to your point, when we did our combination drug and we presented to the FDA, we actually got a call from one of the senior officials. They normally never call you. You just apply. It's very bureaucratic. And uh, this guy called us. He said, you know, Janet Woodcock, who's the head of the FDA, she really liked where you guys are going. This is her 23rd century plan. So the point is the FDA wants to move in this direction. But they can't because the pharmaceutical guys twist their arms all day. But we could take our results and do it in human cells. In fact, that's what we're going to do. But they let us go to a phase two because the two drugs that we're using, both were tested earlier in other cancers, right? So it's not, so the FDA is concerned about one thing, toxicity. They don't want, that you can give anything. It could have zero effect as long as you don't kill anyone, right? So we proved that we didn't have any toxic issues and we proved efficacy through in silico. So does that answer your question? So, Exactly, right, so, 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 yes, so that's a good question. So what we did is when we built, I don't have screenshots of our software, we built our entire technology for what we call an exit, okay? I've never done that before, which means that we want you, let's say you say, hey, this is interesting, prove it to me. You could literally come, you know, typically if you ever sell a company, you have to bring in, the accountants come in and the lawyers come in and they want to, they open the hood and they go through everything. So we designed our software so, a guy like you could come in, so you could say, show me the model, show me all the papers, show me the rate constants, show me the coupling. So we have it so you could actually tear through it. So, and what we want to end of the way show, show is at the end of the day, everything we're getting is from publicly funded research that we've coupled. So the question you should have is, whether, was our coupling done right? You know, and, and for that, we've published, we just published a paper in Cell where we created the first integrative model of nitric oxide release. And that went through two years of peer review. So we know our, and, and we did wet lab to verify that at Mass General, at, I mean, at Brigham and Women's. So we know our, our coupling works if, it, now the only thing you can argue is whether that experiment, bogus, 
whatever, right? But that's given as though if that's gone through peer review, there's some level of um, stability there. But it could be if the research is all garbage, yes, what we generate. But we're assuming, but we can keep iterating on this, right? We've created a framework. As new research comes, we can keep iterating. Good question. Yeah, should I go back? Did you give it to um, uh, Gawande? Did Gawande, where did you get that diagram? Oh, that diagram. Gawande actually uses it somewhere. In I don't know where he got it, but a friend of mine, Jim Coleman, okay. is a professor at Suffolk, and he just wrote a book on Florence. And he gave that to me as a gift. It's, it's actually a picture, and I have it on my wall at home. Yeah. But Jim wrote a book on Florence Nightingale. He's the first guy who brought out, it's a biography that brings out the fact that she wasn't just a nurse. Most biographies of, I mean, I read Florence Nightingale when I was nine years old, and you know, I just thought it was a nurse with a candle running around with a white hat. That's, that's the narrative, right? Any other questions? Okay, okay great. Good, thank you. <laughs>